All right, so reviewing what's been done about thermodynamics up until this point. Um, one of the first things that's been introduced about thermodynamics is the first law of therm thermodynamics. And the first law of thermodynamics is often summed up as this uh, idea of the conservation of energy. This idea that energy cannot be created or destroyed. This is a fundamental principle in all of chemistry. This idea that you can transfer energy from one form to another, but you can't make it out of nothing and it can't be destroyed. Okay. And so that's what we often see is transfers of energy. But again, it can't come out of thin air. All right. So this would have been one of the first things that we would have talked about with regard to energy. And I, I will just say, actually, before we move on, energy is a particularly tricky concept for early chemistry students to wrap their heads around. I remember it took a very long time for me to get comfortable with this idea of like energy, because it's almost like this all encompassing thing, right? I mean, it's something that we can measure. It has units associated with it, joules, but like sometimes it's in the form of work that's performed like you learned about in your physics class sometimes it's in the form of heat i mean that's what makes energy particularly tricky is the fact that it takes all these different forms it's all still the same one thing still the same one concept of energy but it takes multiple forms and that's this idea of transferring right you can transfer mechanical energy into thermal energy etc cetera, etc cetera, right and that's like almost what makes it very tricky to wrap our heads around. Okay. Um, so what we're going to, we're going to sort of pick it apart piece by piece here. All right. But uh, it is something that I understand is a little hard to wrap our head around. So again, just picking it apart piece by piece. One of the things that we've learned up until this point is this idea that quite simply, you can't just make energy out of nothing, right? It can't be created or destroyed, only transferred. And now we're going to introduce, and I'm going to sort of introduce it in this dumbed down way right now. And then just so we can have it in the back of our minds to think about, this is now the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. And we're going to state it like really formally here in a bit, but right now we're going to talk about it kind of in a dumbed down way, just so we can keep it in the back of our mind. And the second law of thermodynamics basically states that all energy is dissipated throughout the universe. Okay, so again, we'll state this more formally, but this is basically what the second law of thermodynamics is saying, is that energy for any process that occurs, energy is going to be dissipated throughout the universe. Okay, and kind of how I think about it is the universe is the ultimate tax man. For every single process that occurs, there's an energy tax, and the universe takes that energy tax in order for this process to actually occur. No process can occur without the universe getting its cut. Okay, and again, we don't really know what I mean by that quite yet. We're going to see and define this way more formally. But if I'm kind of like breaking it down into little pieces... That's how I think about it. I think about the universe as the tax man and every single process that occurs, the universe gets its cut of energy. Okay. Um, and, you know, kind of the bottom line is that the universe hates concentrated energy. Okay, there is no like spontaneous process that organizes stuff into this concentrated form of energy. Spontaneous processes always do the opposite. They disorganize, they disorder, uh, they dissipate energy. Okay, and so we'll sort of go through and talk about some concrete ideas, but just to sort of have this stuff in the back of our mind, this is what we're going to be establishing today. Whoa. Um, no. All right, my bad.
All right. Sorry. <laughs> Minor interruption. All right. So anyways, uh, this is what we're going to be establish establishing today is the second law of thermodynamics. And so just to keep this in mind here, again, this is this idea that energy likes to be dissipated throughout the universe. The universe does not like organize stuff. It disorganizes stuff. All right. And we'll see what we mean by that a little bit more as we go forward here. Okay. And really what we want to be able to accomplish by the end of the day today is to develop something called a chemical potential. Do chemical reactions occur spontaneously? Meaning on their own. Okay, so this is what we're going to hope to develop is uh, add this to our sort of understanding of thermodynamics, this idea of a chemical potential. Do chemical reactions occur spontaneously, right? So given a chemical reaction, we want to know whether or not it actually happens. And we're going to call this chemical potential delta G. All right, and we're going to work to build that delta G today. All right, um, so, and what do I mean by chemical potential? Right, kind of analogous to this idea that we learned about in physics, where we have a potential energy that's stored in, let's say, if we lift a weight, and we know that if an object has potential energy, then it will move spontaneously because of that potential energy. Right. If I pick up a, you know, pick up this book right here, I give it a bunch of potential energy. If I let go of it, I know exactly what's going to happen because it has that potential energy. It's going to then spontaneously move in the direction uh, to relieve that energy. So we want to define the same sort of thing for a chemical process, a chemical potential. Right. So this idea that we know that we take sodium chloride and we put it in water, and it will spontaneously dissolve into those ions. We want to be able to establish this idea of a chemical potential that predicts that spontaneous reaction, right? So what we're going to try to do, again, is to define a chemical potential. And this is analogous to what you would have learned about in physics with a potential energy that you use to predict whether or not a process will occur. We're going to do the same thing, but now for chemistry, for a chemical potential. Okay, and one thing that needs to be kind of said right off the bat is this idea that, um, you know, the idea of spontane spontaneity versus speed. Spontaneity. Sorry. Okay, the idea of spontaneity in a chemical reaction is very different from the speed of that chemical reaction. Okay, again, spontaneity is will this process occur, right? Just straight up, does it happen? That's what this idea of spontaneity is. Speed is a different idea. How fast does the process happen? And they seem like they're one and the same, but they're actually very distinct things. Whether or not a process happens, spontaneity is what we call thermodynamics. And speed, so that's the spontaneity aspect, and speed is what we call the kinetics of a reaction, what we're going to spend a whole chapter next time, uh, next week talking about. Okay, so kinetics is how fast a reaction occur. Thermodynamics is does it occur at all? And these are very different things, okay? You know, and just to, just like, as an example. So it turns out that diamonds will spontaneously fall apart into graphite, 
All right, graphite, just like in the, uh, the tip of your pencil. So we have a diamond. It will spontaneously break apart into graphite. However, everybody looking at their jewelry right now really worried. You don't have to worry too much because it happens at such a slow rate. We're talking about, I don't honestly, I don't really know, but like millions of years. Right? So your diamond on your ring right now will absolutely break apart into worthless graphite. That is a spontaneous process that is energetically favorable. It will occur, but it's going to occur on such a ridiculously slow, slow time scale. Doesn't even matter. Doesn't affect anybody. Right? So that's this idea of being energetically favorable versus kinetically favorable, being fast. Okay. And we're strictly speaking about the energetics today, strictly speaking about the thermodynamics. Um, going back to this plot here, the reason why I want to show this is this is something that you guys will see a lot throughout your chemistry career. This is a reaction coordinate diagram. And they've always got these little like humps, right? So you start out at one level. This is your reactants over here. And specifically, it's demonstrating the energy of those reactants. In the middle here, you have your chemical reaction. So in the middle of a chemical reaction, there's always a spike in the energy that occurs. We often think about it as this hump that the reactants have to get over in order to get to the other side, which is the product side. And this, again, tells you about the energy of the products, right? So that's what this diagram is representing, is the, how energy changes in a chemical reaction. Um, in this case, it shows you that the products are actually higher in energy than the reactants are, okay? Um, importantly, when we talk about this diagram here, again, you'll see this for uh, kind of a lot in your chemistry career. The thermodynamic aspect is only at these endpoints here, right? This is illustrating the thermodynamics, the energy level that the reactants start at versus the energy level thermo of the products. Everything that occurs in the middle represents the speed of the reaction, All right? So how large that hump is that these reactants have to go over, that's the kinetics. Whoops. Okay, so when we're talking about the thermodynamics, we're strictly talking about the energy of the reactants compared to the energy of the products we don't care about how long it takes to get there, right? What happens in the middle doesn't matter to us right now. That's not what thermodynamics is all about. We'll deal with that when we talk about kinetics. All right. So again, our goal for today is to try to define this chemical potential. Do chemical reactions occur spontaneously? Okay. And one natural place to start is something that's already been discussed in this course, or actually, I guess the previous semester. And that's this idea of enthalpy, delta H. Okay. This is a previously discussed form of energy that's involved in chemical reactions. This is specifically the measure of heat exchanged by a chemical reaction, right? So you would have talked about this back when you would have learned about calorimetry. Um, yeah, and so, you know, if in this idea of, oh, we wanna find this chemical potential, a natural starting point would be this enthalpy, this idea of heat that's being exchanged by a chemical reaction. 
right? We're going to try to define our chemical potential rel uh, in terms of our enthalpy here. Enthalpy, strictly speaking, is a measure of the heat that's exchanged. Um, let's just remember that a negative delta H, this is what we call an exothermic reaction, whereas a positive delta H is what we refer to as an endothermic reaction. And that delta H is very closely related to this idea of the internal energy. Okay, and this is getting a little wonky in terms of form, uh, formalisms, but you learn that delta H is equal to the internal energy of a system plus pressure times the change in volume. Okay, and this is the work portion of a system. Um, I don't want to get too bogged down in all of this, especially like focusing on the work aspect. Work is an important concept, especially in physics. As far as chemical reactions go, this term right here is basically nothing for the most part. That's kind of not true in all reactions, but for a lot of reactions, they don't perform work. And even reactions that do perform work, that term tends to be pretty minimal, right? So delta H is a great representation of the internal energy of a system. And so kind of like our mechanical potential, it would make sense that negative delta H's lower internal energy would be something that would be favored by the universe, right? Just like the universe likes to deliver the book on the floor rather than hold it up in the air, because that is the uh, form that has the least amount of potential energy. It would make sense for negative delta H's, what we call exothermic reactions, to be very favorable. And positive delta H's to be unfavorable. Right. If we're going to define this idea of a chemical potential, whether or not a chemical reaction occurs, it makes sense that chemical reactions that deliver the system to the lowest energy state because they have a negative delta H would be something that would occur spontaneously. And that the opposite endothermic reactions where the energy is increasing in the system, that those would be unfavorable. All right, so that's just kind of like, a, okay, we're trying to define this idea of chemical potential. We're going to start with this form of energy we've already talked about. Well, doesn't it make sense that the universe wants the lowest energy system? That would mean that exothermic would be favorable and endothermic would be unfavorable. And for the most part, this is absolutely true. Okay, the vast majority of chemical reactions that happen spontaneously are exothermic reactions. Most reactions release heat, okay? So exothermic reactions are indeed favorable in that sense. The problem is we know that there are some endothermic reactions as well. It's not like every endothermic reaction is unfavorable and every exothermic reaction is favorable, right? Um, Exothermic reactions are favorable, but what about that small number of endothermic reactions we know occur? How does that make sense? So we're going to be able to talk about our chemical potential. Okay, so this is our goal is to define this chemical potential. And we're gonna say that our chemical potential does include this enthalpy term, but there's something else missing, right? Enthalpy accounts for a good amount of whether or not a reaction is favorable or unfavorable, but it's not 100% bulletproof, right? There are still these endothermic reactions that occur. And how do we explain that? So we're going to have to add this other aspect to our chemical potential here. And so let's take a look at some of these reactions that are endothermic that do occur. Um, the best example 
or rather, I guess the one that we're going to focus on, is this idea of phase changes. So for example, if we have ice melting into water, this is an endothermic reaction. It's a phase change, but yes. Right, we know that ice will spontaneously melt into water. Um, this reaction, when it occurs, the ice is absorbing heat. It's not releasing heat, it's absorbing heat. So this would be an endothermic reaction. So it's endothermic, but it's also spontaneous. All right, and again, that's our idea is that we want to define this idea of a chemical potential, which tells us whether or not uh, spontaneous our process will occur spontaneously. We said that exothermics are very favorable because they return the system to a lower energy state. Endothermics are not as favorable, but here we have an example of an endothermic process that is spontaneous. Okay, so how do we explain this endothermic process actually occurring? Um, this is where we're going to introduce this new idea, right? So we're going to add this new term here to our chemical potential. And this is what we're going to call entropy. All right, so this phase change being spontaneous can be explained by this concept of entropy. All right, entropy is another form of energy, right? Again, energy is such a pain in the butt conceptually because it takes all these different forms. We talked about mechanical en energy, like when you hold a book up. We talked about thermal energy, like when reactions release or absorb heat. Now we have this new form of energy, entropy, okay? And so importantly, entropy is an energy. Okay, but it's the energy of disorder or randomness in the universe. And let me just take a second to uh, say, yes, that's the weirdest concept in the entire world. All right, this idea that there's an energy of disorder or an energy of randomness. Like, what the heck does that even mean? I remember when I was a student learning about this concept of energy, and they were like, yeah, en entropy, uh, I'm sorry, learning about this concept of entropy and hearing like entropy is randomness. And I was like, well, that can't be true. I mean, they've got to be lying to us in some way. And let me just tell you, after all these years of studying chemistry, that is indeed the case. OK, this idea of having entropy and randomness tied together in your mind, that's a good thing. Like, that's exactly how you want to think about it. What's wild is like why it exists. It turns out that the universe is, again, wants energy to be dissipated. There is a certain energy benefit associated with processes that cause more disorder, more randomness. Okay, there is literally an energy dedicated to processes being more random. All right. And again, that's like, what the heck does that even mean? Let's let's think real quick. Um, one example of something that's highly ordered would be something like a house. Right. If you build a house. All those bricks are in the right place. All those boards are in the right place. All these nails are in a specific place. You have these rooms that are laid out, some with carpet, some with tile. It's this incredibly ordered structure. And the universe hates order, right? So think about how we have these natural disasters, be it uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, all of that sort of stuff, right? Every single one of these natural uh, occurrences will spontaneously destroy houses, destroy all that order. 
because the universe wants things to be disordered. I have never once heard of a hurricane that has put a house together, that has built a house, right? Never does it go the opposite direction. Never do these natural disasters assemble bricks and boards and nails and carpet and all that crap into a house. It always turns it into a disordered pile of rubble, right? So there's this natural push towards the disordered state not the other direction. You have to put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into building a house, right? A lot of work goes into creating a structure with that level of order. The universe wants it disordered, okay? And so that's what entropy is, is this push towards disorder. Things that create more randomness, that create more disorder are energetically favorable. So then why would ice melting into water, despite being an endothermic process, be something that occurs spontaneously? And that is because it is entropically favorable. It creates more disorder. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's think about it. Let's think on the molecular level here. If I take some ice, ice is water in its solid form. So in this very organized structure, when ice melts and converts into liquid water, liquids are very disordered. Right. No longer are those water molecules sitting in place right next to each other. Now they're tumbling around in no set sort of a position. So despite being an endothermic process, melting is something that occurs spontaneously because it leads to a more disordered system. And that's what the universe wants to happen. It wants to see disorder. Likewise, uh, one other thing that we had talked about was this idea of um, salt dissolving in water. Why does salt dissolve in water spontaneously? This is also an endothermic process. It actually depends on the type of salt that you have. Some salts are endothermic when they dissolve. Other salts are exothermic when they dissolve. It really depends on the identity of the salt. However, for sodium chloride, it's an endothermic process and nonetheless, Salt dissolves in water. We, we all know this, right? Why is that? Because again, this creates disorder. You have these sodium ions and chloride ions that are all sitting next to each other, all lined up together in this solid form here. And when you take that and dissolve it into water, right? So I guess just to be clear, that means that our sodium chloride solid is a very ordered system. And then we take it and we dissolve it in water. Well, now those ions are dissociated. They're all freely floating around independent of one another. So this is a more disordered state. It's very messy, sorry. So again, something that's entropically favorable increases the entropy of the system. Okay. Um, so yeah, so again, what we want to think about with entropy is this idea that there's this energy associated with disorder or randomness in a system. The universe wants that disorder. The universe is a chaotic, chaotic place. All right. Okay. Um, so one, so we want to sort of talk about this idea of entropy a little bit more. Okay, so again, we said energy of disorder. We're just going to kind of keep that short, simple phrase in our minds as we discuss things going forward here. Okay. Um, sort of strictly speaking, and this is where it gets a little bit wonky here, if we're going on to like a statistical mechanics definition here, entropy is the number 
of chemically equivalent ways um, to arrange a system. All right. And so look, so this is uh, this is how I want you to think about it. This energy of disorder, this is the phrase you keep in mind. When you think entropy, you think energy of disorder, energy of randomness. Okay. This here is like the wonky um, technical definition. All right, and we have to formally introduce this concept, but I will tell you that this is what I think of when I have it in my brain. This does not necessarily help as the go-to concept. Um, it is how it's formally defined. It's how if you were in statistical mechanics, a higher level chemistry class, it's exactly how you would think of energy. And it's not that it's not true. It's just a little bit complicated and hard to wrap your head around. And so it's hard to see why it's true for certain things. OK, so we're going to we're going to talk about this wonky technical definition here to in introduce entropy. But really, again, if I'm going to have one thing in my brain when I think of entropy, it's going to be this idea that it's the energy of the randomness of a system or the energy of the disorder. OK. Um, Ex like thinking about this little wonky definition here, though, we're going to use this to explain this idea of um, gas expansion. Okay. So we're going to use gas expansion. We're going to use this to help us illustrate our wonky definition. Okay, so we have this container full of a gas. And on when we start out, we're going to start out our system in what we're going to call state A, where all of those four gas molecules, we're going to limit to, it to a system of four gas molecules just to make our lives easier. All of it are located in this first chamber here. Okay, now we're going to open up this little stopcock in the middle. And we wanna know which one of these states is going to be more favorable, right? Given this system time to reach an equilibrium here, is it going to stay in state A where all of those gas molecules are sitting in this first chamber here? Is it gonna to go to state B where every single one of those gas molecules are gonna move over to that other chamber? Or is it going to go to this third state, state C, where you have an even distribution where two are in one and two are in the other? Okay, and so for the sake of doing our eye clicker thing here. Sure. Um, I want you guys to take a minute and tell me whether you think this system will go to states A, B, or C. What's going to be the natural resting place for this system here? Right, and again, the whole idea is I start out in this state A, but then I'm gonna open this little device in the middle so these gas particles can, if they want to, freely sort of move about. And I want to know which one of these states are going to be the resting state here.
All right. So it turns out that it is indeed state C that's going to be the resting state of this system, where you have an equal distribution of gas molecules between the two chambers. Okay. So why is that? We're going to, again, we're going to use this to illustrate this wonky definition here, right? Because if this is what we would call the macro state, this is what we observe where two gas molecules are here. And two gas molecules are here. Right? There are many different micro states that will accomplish this one macro state. What do I mean by that? Well, let me just go ahead and I'm going to label these gas molecules one, two, three, and four. And there's actually a bunch of different arrangements that I can have with those four gas molecules that will lead to the same two and two distribution, right? I can have one and two on the left and three and four on the right. Or I can have one and three on the left and two and four on the right. Or one and four on the left and two and three on the right, et cetera, et cetera. These are all these micro states that lead to that same macro state of two gas molecules over here and two gas molecules over here. Right, so these are all these equivalent ways to arrange this system that lead to the same observation, that lead to the same two gas molecules. If we look at our other possibilities here, there's only one way to create state A. And that is if all one, two, three, and four molecules are on the left and none are on the right, right? So there's exactly one micro state that corresponds to this macro state. Likewise, for state B, there's only one way to do it, and that is to put all one, two, three, four gas molecules on the right and have nothing on the left, right? So each one of these has one micro state, whereas state C has six micro states. There were six ways to arrange this particular system and get this same result, right? Those were these six here that we were talking about. One and two, verse three and four. One and three, verse two and four, right? These are six different ways that you could arrange those four gas molecules and get to that same observation of having it be equally distributed, right? And so the state with the more micro states is the one with higher entropy. All right. So again, we're, we sort of use this gas expansion to help us explain this sort of wonky definition of entropy as being the number of chemically equivalent ways to arrange a system. Um, again, kind of what I have in the back of my mind is this idea that it's an energy of disorder. Again, this definition here is going to be really helpful. when you get to a particular course, which is a very cool course, don't get me wrong, I'm a little above our pay grade right now, called statistical mechanics. Okay, so again, that is formally what entropy is. This idea of you have the, the state that's preferred is the one where there are the more chemically equivalent ways to arrange a system. Um, what we're gonna see going forward is that this is the more helpful definition to kind of have in the back of your mind. All right. So, so now we have this idea of entropy here. And since we have defined this concept of entropy, we get to now go back to our second law of thermodynamics and state it more formally, right? So this is now the second law. Uh, actually, I guess let's let's just go back to what we had said as our kind of 
intro to it. Right, so we had talked about the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. Said all energy is dissipated throughout the universe. We're going to think of the universe as being sort of this tax man that collects this energy tax and that the universe hates this concentrated energy, right? This is what we sort of had like, oh, this preview to the second law of thermodynamics. Now we're going to get to our real deal definition here. So the second law of thermodynamics for realsies. All right, so formally speaking, the second law of thermodynamics is this idea that all spontaneous processes increase the entropy of the universe. There is nothing that is allowed to occur in this world unless it increases the entropy of the universe. Okay, that is the second law of thermodynamics. All right, so this idea that delta S, the change in entropy of the universe, has to be greater than zero. We can sort of sum up the second law of thermodynamics that way. All right, so if we think about the change in entropy of the universe for any process that occurs, it's going to be a sum of two components here. And this is something that you would have introduced when talking about enthalpy to begin with. This idea that it's helpful to uh, define the system and its surroundings, right? Energy is usually transferred from the system. And in chemistry, when we're talking about the system, we're talking about like the chemical reaction itself and the surroundings, everything else, right? So the universe will then be a sum of the entropy of the system and the entropy of the surroundings, all right? And again, that has to be greater than zero for anything to occur spontaneously. Okay, so um, let's go back to our, this idea of melting, right? We said that melting was something that was endothermic. Right, but occurs endothermic, but is spontaneous, because it's entropically favorable, right? There is this push towards entropy and melting is a great example of something that would cause more disorder, right? So even though the system is absorbing thermal energy, it's still returning, it's still something that occurs spontaneously because it's entropically favorable, okay? So then what about the opposite? What about freezing? Why does that occur? Okay, this idea that like, okay, well, then why does the universe allow for order then? 
right? Like, I mean, if it's this giant push towards disorder, why does it ever allow for things to become more ordered? So importantly, freezing would be an exothermic process, right? So in that sense, it's energetically favorable because it's releasing heat. So then why does the universe allow it to occur? Okay, because again, we said that the delta S of the universe has to equal the entropy of the system plus that of the surrounding. And we know that if we're freezing, that's a negative delta S of the system, right? The system's becoming more ordered. And so the bottom line is that the in order for this to be true, our second law of thermodynamics, this has to be greater than zero. And since this portion right here is negative, it turns out that in order for this to occur, the entropy increase in the surroundings has to be positive. All right. And so how does that occur? It turns out that your delta S of your surroundings is equal to the negative delta H divided by the temperature. All right, and so just to take a step back, what does this actually mean? Like, I know that this was pretty wonky and mathy here. So what does this really mean? In order for the universe to allow something that produces a lot of order, like freezing of an ice cube to occur, it's only going to do that because the, that process is exothermic. It's releasing heat into the rest of the universe. And that heat that's released goes into creating more disorder of everything around it, right? So the only way that we're allowed to create ordered stuff in this universe is by releasing enough heat to create a bunch of disorder around us. And just going back to this idea of building a house, right? Building a house, a house is an incredibly ordered structure, uh, right? That's not something that the universe really wants. So why does the universe allow it to happen? Because in the process, so much disorder is created from us, you know, releasing heat, right? So if you just think about one dude building a house, that person is going to be consuming a lot of calories in order to make it happen. They're going to be sweating and releasing a lot of heat. The bottom line is the universe gets its cut of energy because of the amount of disorder that's created, the breaking down of those sugars, the, the releasing of heat, the sweating, all that stuff creates enough disorder around it that the universe will allow for that ordered event to occur, right? So the delta S for the universe is always positive if, an, if a process occurs that is entropically unfavorable, it's because the surroundings are increasing in entropy enough, and that's through heat lost, right? So this idea of the universe as a tax man, this is what's called the heat tax. All right, because that's the way that the surroundings increase in entropy.